we'll be in Ecclesiastes this evening. If you've got a copy of God's word, please open it up to Ecclesiastes. And as you do, I'd like to, to introduce the text that we'll be in, in chapter eight and nine, with a bit of English history. On a cold, dark evening, November 25th, about 900 years ago, in the year 1120, a luxury rowing ship set out from the Normandy coast across the 20 mile wide English Channel. It was taking its 300 passengers back from a successful diplomacy trip and it included in its passenger list a number of English royalty, including the only male heir to the English throne. They had just completed this successful mission in France, and they were all excited to, to quickly get home across the short English Channel. Uh, soon after the White Ship, as it was named, left the North Coast, a thickening fog enveloped the ship. And it impaired the vision of the captain and the crew, and it wasn't long before disaster struck, and the ship, the great white ship, slammed into a massive underwater rock and began to sink. Total chaos, as you can imagine, ensued aboard. The ship and its passengers panicked, the crew panicked. The Prince of England, obviously considered to be the most important soul aboard the ship that night, uh, was given the only safety boat that the white ship had. Mob mentality, of course, took over and a bunch of people jumped into the prince's boat and it promptly sunk. With, only, with the only safety boat for the ship gone, everything seemed to be hopeless. The night was growing darker and it was practically certain that soon every person would be dead at the bottom of the English Channel. But... There's a reason we know about the details of this tragedy. There was one poor servant who, instead of giving in to the temptation to join in the chaos, he determined to cling to the mast of the ship. While everyone around him was panicking and looking for help in all the wrong places, this servant boy calmly and collectively made his way to the center of the ship wrapped his arms around the mast, which seemed to be the most sure part of the ship. And as the night progressed, and as the ship slowly sunk, and as the panic increased among the rest of the doomed passengers, the servant boy clung to that mast with all of his might. Here's an excerpt from one of the historical accounts I read about this white ship tragedy. When the wintry sun rose, the servant, faint and benumbed, was still clinging to the mast. It was beginning to grow light when three fishermen, passing their boat, caught sight of something poking out of the water. They rowed near to see what it was and found a poor servant, almost dead from cold, still clinging to the very top of the mast. The fishermen lifted him into their boat and took him to safety. For that poor servant on the great white ship, after seeking to navigate the fog, looking death straight in the face, clinging to the mast of the ship was his source of salvation. And for us, as poor servants of our sovereign God, clinging to the mast of God's truth about who he is in relation to us and how we ought to respond to that truth, is likewise the source of our salvation. And in our text tonight, Solomon, the author of the book of Ecclesiastes, spells out a magnificent truth to which he calls his readers to cling. About a month ago when Pastor Jesse asked me to pick a section of Ecclesiastes to bring before you all tonight, this text, chapter 8, verses 16 to chapter 9, verse 9, immediately stood out to me. Because it's sort of a, a microcosm, a summation of the whole book. And in the context of Solomon's flow of thought and in light of his purpose for writing the book, which, by the way, is in chapter 12, 13, and 14, Solomon tells his readers, fear God. This is your salvation. Then, 
Experience the enjoyment of life God has given you, which is your blessing. And as we'll see as we work through the text, he presents a number of hard truths for us to reckon with before he reveals his grand imperative at the end of the passage to enjoy life in the fear of God. Let's look at the text, let's read it once, then we'll chop it up and break it up, and I'll try my best to explain it. Ecclesiastes 8, 16 to 9, 9 says this. When I gave my heart to know wisdom and to see the task which has been done on the earth, even though one should never sleep day or night, I saw every work of God. And I concluded that man cannot discover the work which has been done under the sun. Even though man should seek laboriously, he will not discover. And though the wise man should say, I know, he cannot discover. For I have taken all this to my heart and I explain it that righteous men, wise men, and their deeds are in the hand of God. Man does not know whether it will be love or hatred. Anything awaits him. It's the same for all. There's one fate for the righteous and for the wicked, for the good, for the clean, for the unclean, and for the man who offers a sacrifice, and for the one who doesn't offer a sacrifice. For the man who offers a sacrifice and doesn't offer sacrifice, as the good man is, so is the sinner. As the swearer is, so is the one who's afraid to swear. This is an evil in all that's done under the sun, that there is one fate for all men. Furthermore, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil and insanities in their hearts throughout their lives. Afterwards, they go to the dead. For whoever is joined with all the living, there is hope. Surely a live dog is better than a dead lion. For the living know they will die, but the dead do not know anything, nor have they any longer a reward, for their memory is forgotten. Indeed, their love, their hate, their zeal have already perished and they will no longer have a share in all that is done under the sun. Go, then, eat your bread in happiness. Drink your wine with a cheerful heart, for God has already approved your works. Let your clothes be white all the time. Let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the woman you love all the days of your fleeting life, which he has given you under the sun. For this is your reward in life and in your toil in which you have labored under the sun. This text breaks up pretty nicely into three main headings. And if you'll indulge me, we'll put them this way. From, verses, from verse 16 of chapter 8 to the first verse of chapter 9, we'll call it the thickening fog. Then in verse 2 to 6 of chapter 9, we'll call it the imminent death And then we'll see the joyful rescue in 9, 7 to 9. The thickening fog, the imminent death, and the joyful rescue. Let's start out back in verse 16 under the thickening fog. Solomon opens up this this new section of his book with one of his most used phrases in all of Ecclesiastes. Look with me at the very beginning of verse 16. I gave my heart to know. He uses some version of this phrase every time he's getting ready to deliver one of his big, sweeping, grand conclusions about some aspect of reality in life. Back in chapter 1, verse 13, he says, I set my mind to seek and explore by wisdom. In 117, he says, I set my mind to know. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I said to myself, more, transla- more literally translated, my heart. I said to my heart. Chapter 2, 3 I explored with my mind, 723. I tested all this with wisdom, 725. I directed my mind to know, to investigate, and to seek wisdom with an explanation, and to know, 89. All this I have seen and applied to my mind, 91. For I have taken all this to my heart. And now here in verse 16 of chapter 8, when he says that he gave his heart to know wisdom and to see the task which has been done, on the earth, and that he saw every good work of God, he's telling us that he, as a flesh and blood human being, has spent considerable time and effort trying to find the answers to some of the questions that plague him. You see, Solomon's life was a very unique one. 
We get a good window into it in 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, and 2 Chronicles. This morning, Pastor Jesse so well walked us through Solomon's rise to power and his prosperity. Solomon had access to everything. Anything he could dream of was at his fingertips, right up until the end when he lost everything. And although Solomon was wise when it came to the worldly metrics of success, his spiritual life was a wreck. He allowed the the sneaky poison of sin to infiltrate his heart and cause corrosion. He sought satisfaction in all the wrong places. He admitted this at the end of his life, that he thought that his pursuit of pleasure would bring him happiness, but it was just an illusion. We can see that back in chapter two of Ecclesiastes. He says, I considered all my activities which my hands had done and the labor which I had exerted and behold, all was vanity. That could be, should be more literally translated transience or brevity or mistiness. He says, behold, all was misty and striving after a wind and there was no profit in anything that I sought. We're talking about the most successful man in the history of the world. This is what he's saying about his accomplishments. He spent his whole life seeking answers to the deep questions inside him. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, we get to see this gem. Ecclesiastes, we get to see this post-rock bottom Solomon, aged Solomon, wise Solomon, saved Solomon. We get the divinely inspired answers to all of his deepest questions. This book is gold. And if we're being honest, some of Solomon's big, hard questions aren't very different than our big, hard questions. The more I study Ecclesiastes, the the more I think of this book as a sort of self-moderated cosmic Q&A with the wisest man who ever walked the earth, not to mention the inspiration of God behind his pen. And in these first three verses of our passage for tonight, he's gonna ask and answer two fundamental questions. The first is this. Is God really in control of everything that happens in this world? His answer is absolutely. Look at verse 17. Solomon describes every single thing that has ever and will ever happen as, quote, the work of God. He attributes everything to God's plan. He concludes in in verse one of chapter nine that all people, all events, and all activities are in the hand of God. Turn with me back to chapter three and we'll see this in a different form. Chapter three, one to 10. This is my favorite poem ever. Solomon gives us this poem about the sovereignty of God. He says in verse one of chapter three, there's an appointed time. Subtext there is, God has appointed these times. There's an appointed time for everything and there's a time for every event under heaven. God has appointed the time to give birth. God has appointed the time to die, a time to plant, a time to uproot what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to tear down, a time to build up, to weep, to laugh, to mourn, to dance, to throw stones, to gather stones, to embrace, to shun embracing, to search, to give up as lost, to keep, to throw away, to tear apart, to sew together, to be silent, to speak, a time to love, a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. The beauty of this poem from Solomon is that it not only points to God's comprehensive sovereignty, but also his meticulous sovereignty. God isn't just sovereign over the fact that all things happen. He's also sovereign over the specific details and circumstances and timing of all things that happen. He's planned everything out according to his divine and perfect design, and that's what Solomon wants to get through our thick heads. Solomon elsewhere in Proverbs 16.33 says, the lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from who? 
the Lord. 16.4 of Proverbs, the Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. Proverbs 21.1, the king's heart is like channels in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. In Daniel 4, we get another glimpse of God's comprehensive and meticulous sovereignty. All the inhabitants of the, lo- of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? Isaiah 46, 9 to 11, gives us another glimpse into God's comprehensive sovereignty. Remember the former things long past, this is God speaking, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things which have not been done, saying, my purpose will be established, and I will accomplish all my good pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, The man of my purpose from a far country, truly I have spoken, says Yahweh. Truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it, surely I will do it. Job, in his brush up with the Lord, after his his argumentation and questioning and answers from Yahweh, he he gets to a point where he can utter these words in Job 42, 2. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. A psalmist in 3311 says, the counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart from generation to generation. You see, God is comprehensively sovereign, but he's also meticulously sovereign. And here in Ecclesiastes, Solomon, along with the rest of scripture, proclaims this truth. So the first question Solomon has brought up implicitly and answered explicitly is, is God really in control of all that happens in the world? His answer is yes, absolutely. The second question that he asks is, can people have access to the full understanding of God's master plan? Solomon's answer is no, we can't. In only two verses, Solomon clearly states four times that man cannot know the details of God's grand design. Get your eyes on the middle of 17. He says, I concluded that man cannot discover the work which has been done under the sun. Even though man should seek laboriously, he will not discover. And though the wise man should say, I know, he cannot discover. For I have taken all this to my heart and explain it that righteous men, wise men, and their deeds are in the hand of God. Man does not know whether it will be love or hatred. Anything awaits him. We see this same truth from a different angle a couple pages to the right in Ecclesiastes 11. In verse one of Ecclesiastes 11, he says, cast your bread on the surface of the waters for you will find it after many days. Now, what Solomon is not telling us to do is go to Holmes Lake, chuck some bread on the water, and hope the wind brings it back in a few days and eat it. That would be a misunderstanding of the literal hermeneutic and also very soggy, and probably if there's an algae bloom, very dangerous. Here he's he's not talking about throwing bread on water. He's actually talking about taking action, even though predicting the outcome of that action is impossible. Back down in verse four of chapter 11, he says, he who watches the wind will not sow, and he who looks at the clouds will not reap. Risk-induced stagnancy is not the right response to our lack of knowledge of God's plan. In verse five of chapter 11, he says, just as you do not know the path, the path of the wind and how bones are formed in the womb of a pregnant woman, so you do not know the activity of God who makes all things. Sow your seed in the morning and do not be idle in the evening for you do not know whether morning or evening sowing will succeed or whether both of them alike will be good. Again, in the face 
of the reality that we don't know God's grand master plan, we must still function. We're not allowed to be stagnant. Giving up because it's hard is not a biblical option. Over the past few months, I've, I've realized how many resources uh, Pastor Gil Rue has available for free. By the way, those books are all free. That's awesome. I took them all, and I'm reading them all. Uh, he, he, uh, he said this one phrase in, in something I was listening to, and I thought it was too good not to bring here. He says, wisdom is not knowing everything or, or having all the answers. Wisdom is living with the recognition that God is sovereign. Amen. When we come to grips with our ignorance, we can't help but cultivate a greater dependence on the one who is not ignorant. We navigate the years of our lives much like the white ship navigated those 20 miles between France and England in fog. We aren't granted access to the whole plan. We simply don't know what's coming. We get to see some of the broad strokes of God's plan and the way he's decided to reveal them to us in scripture. And we know how it ultimately ends, but we don't know how our lives will play out exactly. We all know by experience that we don't have access to God's plan. Our experience in seeing God's plan is sort of how I imagine a spider would view a painting if it was crawling on it. The spider crawls on the surface of a magnificent oil painting and it can get a little bit of a sense of the colors and maybe the shades, but as soon as it moves a few inches, it's on a brighter stroke of oil. Then it moves a few more inches and it's on a darker stroke, then a colorful one, then a black and white one. The spider crawling over an oil painting cannot grasp the fullness of the picture. And similarly, We experience God's master plan in real time without any perspective of omniscience. We can't possibly understand the specifics of what God has in store for the future and how exactly all of the little factors are gonna work out in the end. We know this from Paul in Romans 8, 28, where he says, God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. So for those who fear God, the grand masterpiece will work out for good. Maybe a different definition of good than we all think of when we're thinking on an earthly plane, but it will turn out good. We crawl through life, this life experience it in real time, experiencing the good and the bad while not having a crystal clear understanding of what's coming next or how it all worked together. Just like Solomon throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, we naturally want, we desire to understand the how and the why behind the way things happen. Especially when the brushstrokes that we're experiencing are dark and painful. And so we naturally ask God for answers. And as we inquire of God's plan, we would do well to pay attention to Solomon's example in his same quest toward answers. Walt Kaiser is, a, is one of my favorite commentators and theologians for his uh, faithfulness to the literal, grammatical, historical hermeneutic. Uh, I was perusing Twyla's selection over there and I saw a little volume from him, a devotional on Ecclesiastes, so I had to pick it up. And he said this in the section we're studying tonight. Our quest to understand the totality of God's plan must end where Solomon's did. In the fact that God sits at the helm, ruling and overruling for good. Solomon concludes his quest with the words, man cannot know. We navigate this life in a fog. Look at that last sentence of verse one of chapter nine again. We don't know what's before us. Anything may be before us. But look at what he says in the first part of that same verse. For I have taken all this to my heart, 
and explain it that righteous men, wise men, and their deeds are in the hand of God. God is in control. We don't know what's going on, but God's in control. For those who've been granted salvation, those who are truly God-fearers, for those who are safe in Christ here this evening, this should be one of the most comforting truths of all of Scripture. God's in control and we're not. God knows everything and we don't. God's almighty and we're just his servants. God has everything planned out for the ultimate good and we're just happy pawns in his chess match. God is sovereign and we're completely reliant on him for everything. We as Christians ought to be content with this reality. Just like the best foot soldiers on the battlefield don't complain to their general about the why and the how behind their orders, mature believers just need to know the what and then execute the duty. As believers, we learn our role in God's plan by studying God's word. And then we go out into the battlefield and and spend every ounce of our energy seeking to execute that plan. Now, of course, it's easy to say that, that we got, that we ought to be content as joyful Christians, and it's hard to actually live it out. Life doesn't always go to plan, does it not? Sometimes bad things happen. Sometimes jobs are lost and the bills mount up on the coffee table. Sometimes selfish sin corrupts an otherwise good marriage. Sometimes doctors hand you a terminal diagnosis. Sometimes children die before their parents. Sometimes life just seems to fall apart in the blink of an eye. Man does not know whether it will be love or hatred. Anything awaits him. We don't have time to get into a robust theology of of contentment and joy, but to suffice it to say that, that when sweetness is put before us, it's easy to be content with God's will. But it's when circumstances turn bitter that our true understanding of God's sovereignty is revealed. Philippians 4, 11 through 12, give us a glimpse into to Paul's wrestling with this truth. He says, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstance I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret to being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Contentment amidst catastrophe is the mark of a godly Christian. Thomas Manton, a 17th century English Puritan, put it this way. If a man wants to be happy, let him seek a sure object for his trust. He won't be afraid of evil tidings, for his heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. He has laid up his confidence in God, and therefore his heart is kept in an equal poise. It's clinging to that which is sure that makes us steady. An accurate and robust understanding of God's comprehensive and meticulous sovereignty necessarily results in a life of stability and surety. Contentment amidst catastrophe is a mark of a genuine God-fearer, a mark of someone who has tethered themselves to the mast of truth who grips tightly to their salvation in a sovereign God. Where did David look when he passed through the valley of the shadow of death? He said, you're with me. Yahweh's rod, the Lord's staff, comfort him. And as Pastor Jesse showed us so well last week in Psalm 121, where did the pilgrim Israelites look for help? when they face dangers along the journey of earthly life. They looked to the Lord. We would do well to heed Solomon's wisdom and come to grips with the fact that that we live in fog and can't help but navigate this life without the answers to all of our deepest questions. But as people who have access to God's word, we do know that when the storm of life brews and hardship and even death are on the horizon, we have a sure source of stability in our salvation. 
And in this next section of, of our text, we're gonna see that death comes to all people. But God's people, those who fear him, know that the place to be when the ship is sinking is right in the center, clinging to the mast. We've seen the thickening fog. Now let's look at the imminent death in verses two through six. Solomon begins his comments on the imminency of death with a summary phrase, it's the same for all. And then the the object to which it refers in that phrase is immediately given in the next phrase. He says, for there is one fate. There's one fate for all. There's one fate. Now that, that word fate I think we have some English connotations attached to it that Solomon would not have approved of. That, that word in Hebrew, I won't even try to pronounce it, uh, lest I bring shame on my Hebrew professor and embarrass myself. It just literally means event or happening. And in this context, it just means it's referring to physical death. Everyone dies. There's one fate. There's one death. There's one ending to this life. There's only one way unless the Lord comes and and, and raptures us to leave this planet. In Ecclesiastes 9.2, we see there's one fate for the righteous and for the wicked, for the good, for the clean, for the unclean, for the man who offers a sacrifice and for the one who does not offer a sacrifice. For the, as the good man is, so is the sinner, and as the swearer is, so is the one who's afraid to swear. This is an evil tiding in all that's done under the sun, that there is one fate for all men. He bookends the phrase there. And notice that the first two categories that he's put before us there, back in verse two, include the righteous and the wicked. And he divides the whole world's population in that one phrase into those who are right with God and those who aren't. He says that they're both going to experience the same ending to this physical life. And if we're unfamiliar with the overarching passage, the overarching message of Ecclesiastes, we may pause at this statement and say, wait a second, is is Solomon contradicting himself or even the rest of scripture here? The righteous and the wicked go to the same place? Is that what he's saying? One fate? Well, remember, the, the word fate just literally means event or shared happening. And he's just referring to the death of all humans. In other words, every person's life will come to an end. Death is the great equalizer, is it not? It's the ultimate leveler of a diverse people. No one can avoid it. Not good people, Solomon says. Not bad people, Solomon says. Not moral people, not immoral people. Rich people, poor people. Everyone in this room, saved and unsaved. I can think of a a number of recent accidents accidents and diagnoses and and surgeries that, that we're experiencing as a church family. Death is just around the corner. We should be reminded of the brevity of life constantly. I know we all know this truth naturally, and, and when it seems as soon as we forget it, fate comes around and, and we see it happen again. Solomon isn't bringing this up just so that we can be reminded of, of a sterile truth. He's he's putting it before us so that we steep our minds in it and our hearts in it. He puts this truth on these pages so that we would evaluate our present lives in light of it. Solomon knows that we know that that we're gonna die. But he's asking us, do you live like it? Solomon so often, with his style, puts obvious truth before his readers so that we would steep ourselves in these truths, ask ourselves if we really live in light of these truths, and then walk away with those truths so ingrained in our souls that we can't help but act accordingly. Dear church, I'm compelled to ask the question from the text, do you live in light of your death? Are are your day-to-day decisions informed by the brevity of your life. There's one fate for all. All of us know this, but do all of us live accordingly? There's one fate for all men. No one can escape this reality, Solomon says. And in light of this truth, he now takes the opportunity to throw a left hook at us and just tell us that we're all totally depraved. 
Look at the second half of verse three. Furthermore, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil and insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives. Note the connection between depravity and insanity. The sin we commit affects our minds and reasoning. It infects, it infects our judgment and causes us to just disregard rationality and morality. As a wise old man who used to occupy this pulpit says, sin makes you stupid. Then in the same verse, after making his point about the depravity of man's soul, he highlights the, dep- the brevity of man's life. Look at the very ending of verse three. Afterwards, they go to the dead. And that phrase, afterwards, they go to the dead, uh, is not really literally translated in our English Bibles. Uh, Solomon, I I believe, is making a a sort of play on words or he's being intentionally abrupt. He actually dropped the verb out of this sentence. If we were to translate it literally, we would say afterwards, they to the dead. He's intentionally abrupt. The brevity of the sentence parallels the brevity of our lives. Solomon is using all of the tools at his grammatical disposal to try to shake us into realizing that life is shorter than we think it is. Death is more imminent than we're prone to think. I was sitting across a coffee table at a coffee shop here in town with a man a few weeks ago. I met him here in the lobby at this church. It was his first time. He came with questions, gave him my phone number, and I said, I've tried my best at some answers. His questions were about the gospel, so we met up at at a coffee shop, and I slowly worked through the gospel with him, showing him that, like me, he's a sinner, deserving of eternal punishment when his short life is over. I lovingly shared with him the truth of, of God's perfection and his own depravity and helplessness, Christ's atoning sacrifice, the Bible's call to repent and put all of his trust and faith in Christ for forgiveness and new life. He walked through all of it with me. I even, he even asked some clarifying questions, and so I knew he understood it. And then, after I urged him to repent and put his faith in Christ, he said that though he understood the truth of the gospel now, he just wasn't in any hurry. I took, this, I took him to this passage And I showed him, I made him read it. He's not guaranteed tomorrow, I said, let alone the rest of even today. And I begged him not to go on living his life in rejection of the truth of the gospel that he now clearly understood. He sat back in his chair and he he cited statistical improbabilities that he would actually die in the next few weeks or even that day. And even though he clearly understood the facts of his spiritual death, the facts of the gospel, he would kick the can down the road just a bit and consider it for some more time. I don't know where he's, actually, he did text me about 10 minutes before I came up here. I don't know where he's at spiritually now. He said he wants to meet up and talk about the gospel some more, so praise the Lord. And as I preach through Ecclesiastes, his face just flashes through my mind constantly. He looked the gospel truth square in the face and said, I don't need this right now. He said, I've got more time. And I wish he could just hear Solomon's own voice telling him, grabbing him by the shoulders and shouting in his face, you don't have more time. Afterwards, they to the dead. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. This life is short. And we ought not to act as though it was long. And dear friends, if you're hearing this and you're unsure of whether you are counted among the righteous or the wicked, if you're here with a friend just to see what this church is all about, but you haven't submitted to Christ, if you've grown up at this sound teaching church but you're not really sure if you've just been faking it the whole time. 
If you have yet to fear God really, if you at all doubt your eternal destination, please heed the words of Solomon here. Heed, even more specifically, the, the, the truth of the New Testament gospel. Reckon with the imminency of your life, Ecclesiastes 9. Realize that your life is a short life. You've already fallen short of God's standard of perfection, Matthew 5, 48. Consider your helplessness on your own, Titus 3, 5. Understand that Christ, the God-man, Colossians 2, 9, died as a sacrifice for your sins, Romans 5, 8. And rose from death and is alive today, 1 Corinthians 15, 4. Turn away from your sinfulness and follow Christ instead, Luke 9, 23. Place your trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior, Romans 10, 9. Friends, life is short. Don't live as if it isn't. Look at verse five and six here. For the, li the living know they will die, but the dead do not know anything nor have they any longer a reward. For their memory is forgotten. Indeed, their love, their hate, and their zeal have already perished, and they will no longer have a share in all that's done under the sun. In these two verses, Solomon makes the point that though imminent, imminent physical death is the great equalizer, while we're still alive, we still have a chance, at least for a little while, to spend our lives on something significant. And back in verse four, he said, a live dog is better than a dead lion. Being less powerful and yet alive is better than being ferocious and dead because someone who's alive still has the ability to turn from their sins and fear God. The advantage of the living is that they know they will die. And since they, they have the imminency of death seared into their consciousness, consciousnesses, they can still do something with their lives for the glory of God. And with the last bit of our lives, however long it may be, Solomon is saying, don't waste it on distractions. Don't waste it on mistiness. Don't waste it on fruitless hobbies. Don't waste your time. Spend it on things that matter. And as we'll see in this last section, Solomon commands us to spend it on joy. Imagine the, imagine the chaos that took place on that white ship when it struck that underwater rock and as water filled the hull and the reality that everyone's lives were about to come to a cold end in the English Channel set in. I imagine some people shouting in despair across the black water hoping that some random boat was, was going by. I imagine others heading over to the galley and drinking themselves unconscious so they wouldn't have to face death. I imagine others clinging to chests and pieces of splintered wood from around the ship, hoping that they would keep them afloat long enough for rescue to come. I imagine others giving up and ending their own lives on their own terms with a, with a dagger to the throat or even just diving into that water prematurely. We can only speculate as to how everyone spent their last minutes of life aboard that ship, but we do know that while others clung to their senses of prideful entitlement, while others clung to their vices, at least one person, that poor servant boy, clung to the mast of the ship. And as the great white ship sunk lower and lower, and as more souls were lost that night, that young servant boy tightened his grip and he shimmied higher and higher on that mast as the ship sunk lower and lower. And in the end, when he was found by those fishermen, he was clinging to the last little tippy top of that mast and as the fishermen pulled him into the boat and they headed for the shore, they warmed him up and they probably gave him, I don't know if they had coffee, they probably had tea. They should have had coffee. 
But as they gave him whatever source of caffeine they decided to give him, can you imagine the sense of relief that flowed through him? Can you imagine the joy that he spent the rest of his, his life enjoying? Someone who truly understands the imminency of death has experienced the, and has experienced the joy of rescue is someone who can't help but be characterized by joy. Imagine that poor servant boy spent the rest of his life in bliss. How much more joyful ought we to be? We've been saved from something far worse than just physical death in the English Channel. As we move into these last three verses of our passage our final, and our final heading, it's important that we take note of Solomon's greater aim for the book. Some people take this next section and use it to support the idea that Solomon was an Epicurean, that he himself taught and recommended that, that others should seek sensual pleasures because that's all we have left in this grim, depressing, pessimistic world. And this couldn't be further from the truth of what Solomon is aiming at. Solomon didn't write a depressing, pessimistic book about getting the most pleasure out of life because that's all we have. Solomon's also not an optimist. Solomon's a realist. He shot straight with his readers. He, he told it like it was. I like to think of Solomon as, as a boxer with truth on his fists. He just pounds us with reality over and over again until we either reject it or submit to it. That's why this book is so controversial. That's why so many people reject Solomonic authorship, even though he obviously claims it was written by him. It's always helpful to remind ourselves of, of the overarching theme or purpose of any passage. No passage exists in isolation. And in the two verses where Solomon gives the point of the book, over in chapter 12, verses 13 and 14, he makes it clear that he's been writing the book for the purpose of exhorting his readers to fear God. He wrote all of this so that his readers would fear God. This book then is predominantly a book about how the spiritual state of man affects how he lives his life under the sun. And now, here in our text, after putting before us the twin truths of, of our lack of access to God's plan and the imminency of our death, he now proceeds to tell us what we should do in response to these truths. We're going to see here in this next section that Solomon calls us to live a life of joy. God-fearers, joy. Here he's assuming that we're... we're a, that we've allowed the truths of the previous verses to penetrate our hearts and lead us to salvation in the fear of God. And now in verses seven through nine, he's gonna tell us that the, the life of a God-fearer is a life of immense joy. So we've seen the thickening fog, the imminent death, and now we see the joyful rescue. Solomon opens up verse seven by saying, go then. Yeah. This is unique for Solomon. He doesn't often do this. He doesn't often give imperatives. He usually just likes to beat us up with truth and let us figure it out. But here he's helping us. He says, go then. He's no longer beating around the bush. Go then, eat your bread in happiness and drink your wine with a cheerful heart. For God has already approved your works let your clothes be white all the time and let not oil be lacking on your head. Enjoy life with the woman you love all the days of your fleeting life, which he has given to you under the sun, for this is your reward. And in your toil, which you have labored under the sun. One commentator on this paraphrased Solomon's exhortation here this way. It's a wake-up call. There's no time to waste Stop your complaining, stop, your, stop nursing your anger, stop brooding about your problems, get over your anxiety. Notice that, that Solomon's call to joy is not a suggestion. Solomon doesn't say, cultivate a feeling of happiness. Solomon isn't promoting the mindset of escapism fueled by fantasy and whimsical pleasure. He doesn't sound like the therapist of our upside down world telling us to remove the toxic relationships from our lives and schedule more self-care time. 
He doesn't sound like the ridiculous, hyper-medicalized and hyper-psychologized Western culture of our day. He's not suggesting that, that we really do have the joy we're looking for deep down and we just need to, to unlock it with yoga and meditation. No, he's commanding us. Be joyful in light of what we've been saved from. Joy isn't primarily an emotive feeling that comes and goes depending on circumstances. To enjoy is an action. And Solomon is telling us here that we must choose it. In fact, elsewhere in Ecclesiastes, he teaches that enjoyment is a, uniquely, is a unique ability of God-fearers. Those who are at enmity with God cannot find true satisfaction. They can't enjoy life. They just keep spinning on that hamster wheel. It's just mistiness, and we translate it as vanity all the days of their life. To, important, to import this truth into to our New Testament church context, Christians should be the most joyful people. Solomon distills the God-fearer's enjoyment of life into five representative items here. Food, drink, clothing, comforting oil, marriage. Solomon wants to make it extremely clear that the life of the God-fearer is a life of joy. It's not a life of dullness. It's not a life of boredom. It's not a life of lameness. Taking this principle and laying it over our context, the life of the Christian is a life of eating and drinking with an attitude of enjoyment. It's a life of, of dressing in such a way as to display outwardly the joy inwardly that we have. A life of a Christian is a life of enjoying even small comforts. A life of delightful marriage for the glory of God. A marriage of quality Christ-like encouragement. A marriage of comfort and safety. A marriage of sex for the glory of God. A marriage that's more than. But if we're being honest, we know that our human experience, in our human experience, even after salvation, we're still affected by sin, are we not? We know that, that there are constantly temptations to see the worst in our situation and focus on it. We're tempted to forget the radicalness of our rescue. And not long after we're saved, we can, we can sometimes allow that attitude of joy to fade away. We're tempted to forget that the blessings we've been given are from God. We complain about our circumstances. We're tempted to forget the vibrancy of Christian life. And we end up representing this Christian life to the outside world as a life that's just crusty and stale. Even here and now, it's common for the Christian experience to seem dull and flatlined. We rightly should want to disassociate ourselves from the world which sinfully engages with those five items, food, drink, clothing, comfort, and intimate relationships, sinfully, we want to disassociate ourselves from that, and we should. But we should be careful to heed the words of Solomon here and avoid being Christians who fail to enjoy that which God has given us to enjoy. You show me a mature Christian, I'll show you one of the happiest people on this planet. Biblical maturity and biblical joy, to bring you back to high school, are positively correlated. They have a linear relationship if you graph them. When a Christian grows in maturity, their perspective on this life becomes more realistic. Not optimistic, realistic. And in turn, they become more steadfastly joyful. We've got to avoid the tendency toward sterile separation of spiritual things and religious things and, and the normal day-to-day -day life. That's not the life of the God-fearer. We cling to the mast not out of desperation and fear, though that might be what got you to cling to the mast in the first place. We cling to the mast with a deep and lasting sense of joy. 
In this passage, God has called us to accept our lack of understanding in his sovereign plan, to reckon with the imminency of our physical deaths, and to therefore fear God and enjoy life. In this passage, God calls us to an examination of our priorities in our hearts. Our lives are short. Our deaths are imminent. Night is coming. The ship is sinking. The water is rising. When the dawn comes, what will we be found clinging to? Will we be found clinging to our vices at the bottom of the English Channel? Will we be found clinging to our worldly desires? Will we be found a fake, having been merely a nominal Christian and relied on that testimony from camp all those years back? Will we be found complaining? Will we be found distracted? Or will we be found clinging to the mast of our sure secure, steady salvation. It's Solomon's hope, and it's my hope, as I echo Solomon's words, that we will be found joyfully living our lives for God's glory as we cling to the mast. Let's pray. God, you wrote these words. You used the experiences and the intricacies of Solomon's unique life to bring these truths into a vibrant clarity. Then you put it on this page and allowed us to come here tonight to read it and submit to it. Thank you. May we live in light of what you've told us here May we act accordingly. In your name, amen.